Our Bible reading for today is the account of the um, Transfiguration from Matthew chapter 17, verses 1 to 9. And if you want to follow it, it's on page 973 of your Pew Bible. After six days, Jesus took with him Peter, James and John, the brother of James, and led them up a high mountain by themselves. There he was transfigured before them. His face shone like the sun, and his clothes became as white as the light. And just then there appeared before them Moses and Elijah talking with Jesus. And Peter said to Jesus, Lord, it is good for us to be here. If you wish, I will put up three shelters, one for you, one for Moses, and one for Elijah. And while he was still speaking, a bright cloud enveloped them, and a voice from the cloud said, This is my son whom I love. With him I am well pleased. Listen to him. And when the disciples heard this, they fell face down to the ground, terrified. But Jesus came and touched them. Get up, he said, don't be afraid. And when they looked up, they saw no one except Jesus. And as they were coming down the mountain, Jesus instructed them, Don't tell anyone what you have seen until the Son of Man has been raised from the dead. Let's bow our heads in prayer. Gracious Lord, we come before you on this Transfiguration Sunday, and on this day, shine the light of your glory on us as we meditate on this word. And may it give us encouragement to live the Christian life for you. In your precious name we pray, Lord Jesus. Amen. And on the basis of this transfiguration being about the vision of his glory, that's what I want to talk to you about this morning, the vision of his glory. Now, sometimes in the journey of life we are faced with sections of life in which we have trials and troubles and hardships and other times we have sections that where life goes pretty good for us. I've experienced these times and I'm sure you all have as well. Today we're celebrating Transfiguration Sunday. Now Transfiguration Sunday bridges the gap between a time in Jesus life when things were relatively good and he was popular in ministry into a time now in the future where we think about him going the way of the cross, when he experienced hardships and difficulties and troubles in his ministry. Now Jesus knew what was well, uh, was, he knew what was lying ahead of him, that he had to go the way of the cross. In uh, Matthew 16, 21, before our reading for today, Jesus says, from that time on, Jesus began to explain to his disciples that he must go to Jerusalem and suffer many things at the hands of the elders, the chief priests, and the teachers of the law, and must be killed, and on the third day be raised to life. Before Jesus lays the way of the cross, and it's going to be a hard road for him, on that way, he would be continually opposed and criticised by the religious authorities, the scribes, the Pharisees, the chief priests of Israel. It would be a way that would cause him sorrow as relationships would change between himself and the disciples and between himself and his mother, Mary. It would also cause him a great deal of spiritual struggle as he tried to do a deal with God in the Garden of Gethsemane to try and find another way out than go the way of the cross. He would experience injustice as he would be found guilty and sentenced to death for crimes that he did not commit. It would be a way that would end in humiliation for him as he would be mocked and uh, for, being, for calling himself a king. He would experience betrayal by his disciples 
and also by the crowds who once followed him. Worst of all, at the end of this way of the cross, he would suffer, worst of all, God-forsakenness, when he would cry out, My God, my God, why have you forsaken me from the cross? The way ahead was not rosy for Jesus. What actually gave him strength to go on in the face of such hardship? What gave him courage to face the future? What gave him faith not to abandon everything and just despair and drop out? Well, it's what we celebrate today in the Transfiguration. Let's look at the text and explain the text. After six days, Matthew writes, that means that this was a Sabbath, this was a worship day, a day when the Jewish people spent time with God. It was a Saturday. And Jesus took with him Peter, James and John. These three were his really special disciples. And he took three with him so that, according to Jewish law, there could be three witnesses to establish that what was actually seen was the truth. And he led them up a high mountain by themselves, and this was probably the mount called Hermon. And there he was transfigured before them. His face shone like the sun, and his clothes became as white as the light. Now, this was more than proof that his mother Mary washed his clothes in Omo white. It was proof that he was truly human and truly divine as the glory of God shone out from within him. It was the revelation of the glory as to who he really was as the second person of the Trinity, as Father, Son and Holy Spirit. And this encouraged him to walk that way of the cross, to go that difficult road. And it was also the revelation of this glory to the disciples that encouraged them to journey with him through his way of the cross and enter into their own journeys to the cross with him. And just then Matthew writes, there appeared before them Moses and Elijah talking with Jesus now, Moses is the representative of the Old Covenant, the law, and Elijah is the representative of the prophets, and he was the appointed restorer of all things. And both the law would be fulfilled and the prophets would be fulfilled through Jesus' death upon the cross. The disciples here witnessed the confirmation when Jesus said to himself, that I fulfill the law and the prophets. Luke 9.31 actually tells us that Moses and Elijah talked with Jesus about his own death. So he knew what was coming. So what did Peter want to do? He wanted to build three shelters up on top of the mountain. But as he was speaking, God interrupted and he said, This is my son whom I love. With him I am well pleased. Now, we've heard these words spoken before to Jesus at his own baptism. And Jesus hears the Father's voice from heaven again to affirm him and encourage him to go that way of the cross. Because on that journey to the cross, the voice of God would be silent. The disciples were terrified. Wouldn't you be? I think I'd be. But Jesus came and touched them and said, Get up. Don't be afraid. And when they looked up, they saw no one but Jesus. And I wonder what they would have thought. Maybe, oh, we're up so high on the mountain, maybe our brains are starved of oxygen and we had a hallucination. Or maybe they wondered, Wow, I wonder what was in that home brew red wine we had for dinner last night. But it was not an illusion. The Sabbath was ending, Sunday was approaching, the new working week was about to begin. It was time to go down the mountain and for Jesus to go the way of the cross. And Jesus said that no one was to be told about the transfiguration until after he was raised. Now, why is this? Because true glory 
is only revealed in suffering. There's no easy way out like Peter, who wanted to build three shelters up the top and stay there in the glory forever and ever. No, glory is only comes in the valley of everyday life through the pain and suffering that we all experience as we journey in this broken world. Jesus never left Peter, James and John on the mountain. He took them back down with him and took him on the journey of everyday experience to the way of the cross. It's a journey that all who would be Jesus' followers must undertake. Once again, Jesus said in Matthew 16, 24, just before the transfiguration, if anyone would come after me, he must deny himself, take up his cross and follow me. One thing that can be guaranteed about the Christian journey is that it will always have times of hardship, troubles and trials. We will have hardships as we carry the name of Jesus Christ in calling ourselves Christian. There will be people who, who will reject us because we believe and try and live by the plain truth of Scripture. They will persecute, laugh and mock us for going to church and follow, trying to follow God's will and ways. We will also face the hardships of living in a broken, imperfect world. Just because we're Christian doesn't mean that we're immune to strife. A child may die, a friend may betray us, flood or fire may strike, a financial difficulty may arise, an illness may debilitate us, a sibling may worry us. All of these hardships in life and the other hardships we have can cause us to stumble and fall. They can cause us to crash out of the way of the cross, to give up on God, to give up on everything and just throw it all in. But what can keep us going when we face the trouble and the hardships of life? What can help us to keep moving when we're facing insurmountable odds and we just want to chuck it all in? Well, the answer is the vision of his glory, the vision of Jesus' glory. On Mount Hermon, the vision of Jesus' glory was given to his three disciples. But on the cross, the vision of his glory was given for all people to see. In Matthew 27, 54, it says, When the centurion and those with him who were guarding Jesus saw the earthquake and all that had happened, they were terrified and exclaimed, Surely he was the Son of God. It was there on the cross that Jesus' true glory was revealed. The vision of his glory was also given to his disciples before he ascended into heaven. And he told them to go and make disciples of all nations, baptising them in the name of the Father, the Son and the Holy Spirit and teaching them to do all that he had commanded them. And surely he would be with them to the very end of the age. So where do we see the vision of his glory today? Well, we only see it by faith. And we see it in the word of the Bible, the Holy Scriptures. We experience it there by faith. We experience it in the water and word of holy baptism, where by faith Jesus comes and, as Clenda said in the talk, washes away our sin. And we experience it by faith in the sacrament of Holy Communion when we receive the bread and wine, the body and blood of Jesus, Jesus himself given for us. One day, the faith, the, what we see by faith, we will one day actually see. And that will happen either when the Lord returns, if he returns in our lifetimes, or in our Christian deaths. And then we will see him as he is, according to what John says in the book of Revelation, dressed in a robe, reaching down to his feet, a golden sash around his chest, his head and hair white like wool, 
his eyes blazing like a fire, his feet like glowing bronze, his voice like the sound of rushing waters, his face shining like the sun in all its brilliance, just like it was at the transfiguration. And he will say, as he said to the disciples on that mountain, do not be afraid. I am the first and the last. I am the beginning and the end. I was dead and behold, I am alive forever and ever. And I hold the key of death and Hades. Jesus holds the key to all of that which would bind us down and which would call us to crash out of the life of faith. Jesus, who was transfigured, who went the way of the cross, was victorious in life and in death for us. And we know that he now reigns all victorious, all glorious, at the right hand of God the Father Almighty in heaven. So in the strength of this vision of his glory, that we can receive the grace, the faith, the strength, the courage to live for God now and remain faithful to our call to be Christian and endure our particular way of the cross and the particular hardships, troubles and trials of life that we have. And as we journey this way of the cross, it always ends in the vision of his glory when what we see now by faith will turn to sight and we will see him just as he really is in all his glory and majesty and power. Praise and glory be to him this day and always. Amen. So Lord, let us keep before ourselves as we journey the way of the cross on this earth, the vision of your glory, knowing, Lord, that you are the one in whom all things will be made new, the one in whom all that is of sin, death and the devil will be defeated, the one in whom we have glory, victory and power and peace in eternity with you forever and ever. Amen. So let's get the main man out the front with his mum and dad and godparents. So if you want to come out the front here, Nikita and Benjamin. Okay, so Nikita, if you'll come and stand there, please. And Ben on the other side of her. And Nicholas and Kira Lee around this side here, please. Okay, thank you. You're all done and dusted and you'll be able to follow the words up on the overhead there. Okay. There is one body and one spirit. One Lord, one faith, one baptism. Baptism is the gift of our Lord Jesus Christ. When he had risen from the dead, he commanded his followers to go and make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit. We have come together today to obey that command. Baptism with water signifies the cleansing from sin that Jesus' death makes possible and the new life that God gives us through the Holy Spirit. In baptism, the promises of God are visibly signed and sealed for us, and we are joined to Christ and made members of his body, the Church Universal. So we welcome you, Lincoln, and your family and friends. We give thanks for you and pray that you may know God's love and faithfulness forever. And so, Benjamin and Nikita, this is the part where you answer on Lincoln's behalf and you would say the next bit's in yellow, please. So, Benjamin and Nikita, will you accept the responsibilities placed upon you in bringing Lincoln for baptism Then say together? Are you willing to answer for Lincoln? By your own prayers and example, by your friendship and love, will you encourage Lincoln in the life and faith of the Christian community? I will with God's help. So I ask you together before God, 
and with this congregation you must affirm that you turn to Christ and reject all that is evil. Do you turn to Christ? I turn to Christ. Do you repent of your sins? I repent of my sins. Do you reject selfish living and all that is false and unjust? I reject them all. Do you re renounce Satan and all that is evil? Almighty God deliver you from the powers of darkness and lead you in the light of Christ to his everlasting kingdom. Amen. So, will you each, by God's grace, strive to live as disciples of Christ, loving God with your whole heart and your neighbour as yourself until your life's end? God's help. You have heard Lincoln's parents respond to Christ. Will you support them in this calling? We give God thanks that at the beginning of creation, God's Holy Spirit moved upon waters to bring forth light and life. With water, God cleanses and replenishes the earth, nourishing and sustaining all living things. Thanks be to God. We give God thanks that through the waters of the Red Sea, God led the people out of slavery into freedom and brought them through the River Jordan to new life in the land of promise. Thanks be to God. We give thanks for God's Son, Jesus Christ, for his baptism by John and for his anointing with the Holy Spirit. Thanks be to God. We give God thanks that through the deep waters of death, Jesus delivered us from our sins and was raised to new life in triumph. Thanks be to God. We give God thanks for the grace of the Holy Spirit who forms us in the likeness of Christ and leads us to proclaim God's kingdom. Thanks be to God. We now give thanks that God has called Lincoln to new birth in the church through the waters of baptism. Pour out your Holy Spirit in blessing and sanctify this water so that Lincoln, who is baptised in it, may be made one with Christ in his death and resurrection. May Lincoln die to sin and rise to newness of life and continue forever in Jesus Christ our Lord, through whom we give you praise and honour in the unity of the Spirit now and forever. Amen. Let us now affirm the faith of the church. Do you believe in God the Father? Creator of heaven and earth. Do you believe in Jesus, in God the Son? I believe in Jesus Christ, God's only Son, our Lord, who was conceived by the Holy Spirit, born of the Virgin Mary, suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, died and was buried. He descended to the dead. On the third day he rose from the dead. He ascended into heaven and is seated at the right hand of the Father. From there he will come to judge the living and the dead. Do you believe in the Holy Spirit? I believe in the Holy Spirit, the Holy Catholic Church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, and the life everlasting. Amen. So, let's baptise the little man. Come here, matey. G'day. So, Lincoln James Taylor, I baptise you in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Lincoln, I sign you with the sign of the cross to show that you are mar marked as Christ's own forever. And I'll give you back to Mum and I'll get the oil and do that because we didn't want to have a meltdown. <laughs> Can you just turn his head around here? 
I anoint you with the sign of the cross, Lincoln. Amen. Lincoln, be a disciple of Christ, fight the good fight, finish the race, keep the faith. Confess Christ crucified, proclaim his resurrection, look for his coming in glory. God has brought you out of darkness into his marvellous light. Shine as a light in the world to the glory of God the Father. So in the light of that little piece of liturgy, Ephraim, we're going to light the baptismal candle from the paschal candle there. There you are, and if you want to give it to um, Lincoln's dad, that's good. And Creed can hold it, how about that? <laughs> you can blow it out. Good on you. Well done. Lincoln, got, done like a true older brother, hey, you know. Lincoln, God has called you into his church. We therefore receive and welcome you as a member with us of the body of Christ, as a child of the one heavenly Father, as an inheritor of the kingdom of God. So I just want to pray for you as a family. Gracious Lord, I come before you to thank you for Ben and Nikita. We thank you for the gifts of their children, of Lincoln, born into your family this day, and, and Creed. We pray, Lord, that you would bless them as they go together in love as a family and as they live in the light of your love. Bless them richly, Lord, and may your goodness and grace go with them each and every day. And bless Ben and Nikita as they raise their boys in the Christian faith. In your precious name we pray. Amen. So, as you go, Ben and Nikita, Lincoln and Creed, the Lord bless you and keep you. The Lord make his face shine upon you and be gracious to you. The Lord look with favour upon you and give you peace. Amen. Amen. Oops, sorry. So that's his baptism certificate. Oh, I've got the dropsies. Good. Okay. And uh, that's a godparent certificate for Kira Lee and for Nicholas. Thank you very much. Okay. We're all done and dusted. And you can keep that for your big brother. Now you'll light that on the anniversary of his baptism each year and remind him that he has the light of Christ living in him just like you do when you were baptised. Okay? Good, thank you.